So, ooh, that's loud. Uh, even if you don't normally go back for when we do like middle school, high school class, uh, today they're not going to do a class. They're going to do like a just kind of a know, round table, I guess. You're going to have a little bit of a discussion with Brandy about what like the future of the program on Sundays looks like. So even if you don't normally go, I'd really recommend going back there. This is public peer pressure. Uh, just so you can kind of have your voice heard and keep abreast of what's going on. Of course, parents will inform you, you know, what the kids and Brandy kind of get up to uh, after it's done, but I don't really know either. We just have a list of ideas and we want to hear their opinions. So if you don't go, you should go. This is your last chance. Seriously. Okay, all right. We've been talking about our uh, mission statement. We talked about uh, being a place of healing and help for our community, about the importance of uh, choosing good leaders and embracing those leaders and trusting those leaders. And today we want to talk about the last part of our mission statement, about providing hope for those around us. Uh, it's pretty obvious, I think, to most of us that hope is not something that our society embraces the way that it should. Now, everyone wants to be hopeful about the future. I've heard all sorts of random anecdotal claims about hope, such as people tend to be very pessimistic about other people's futures, but hopeful about their own. I don't know how true that is. I don't know if there's data to back that up. That's a claim that I've heard thrown around a lot. For example, people tend to be very pessimistic about where the nation is headed. But if you ask them, do you think your life will be better in 10 years than it is today, they'll generally say yes. Now, again, I don't know if there's data to back that up, but anecdotally, I think that pretty well tracks. But I know that our society as a whole doesn't value hope and doesn't push hope to people because I have a news app on my phone. Ready? So let's experiment a little bit. Let's see. If I pull up my news app, what I get given. You guys want to guess? Ukraine scrambles to restore electricity after Russian missile barrage. That's the first one. That's a good one. Uh, China's president, dictator, emerges from the Communist Party Congress with dominance. Homegrown campaign has Democrats feeling resurgent against Senator Grassley. I don't know who Senator Grassley is. Sorry, I'm not abreast enough of politics. Let's see, we have news about someone whose name I don't, uh, I don't recognize losing an eye in one of their hands, so I'm going to assume that they're famous. Um, that's depressing. Something about hybrid burgers that could replace animal meat. That's interesting. <laughs> Everyone's like, that's the one that you guys react to? I'm like, missile barrages and power outages, and you're like, oh, vegans. My goodness. <laughs> we got a bunch of sports news. That's fine. Depending on what team you track with, that might be depressing. Uh, Georgia men come home to pick up their daughter from school and realize it's the same girl. That sounds dramatic. More sports news. Uh, news about an uh, old actress and activist that's been in the news lately. More celebrity gossip, because that's what we need in our lives, right? More sports news, more celebrity gossip, and uh, yeah, more depressing international politics. And 22 horror films from 2022 that you might have missed. I don't watch horror films, so my news app apparently doesn't know me that well. So pretty much we have mindless distractions, celebrity gossip, sports news, and depressing international and national political news. That's a really healthy mix for us, right? There's something that I think we need to keep in mind when we're handling this kind of age of information. That is that your brain was not designed to absorb the amount of information that we're given day by day, especially the amount of bad news that we're given every single day. Human beings, for most of our history, have lived in small, tight-knit communities where you rarely got news from the outside world. Your life was based around you and the couple of dozen people you interacted with regularly, and then beyond that, the circle of, if you were in a large settlement, a couple hundred people that you interacted with in passing from time to time. That was it. But now we're exposed to, many of us, hundreds of people every time we log into Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, and thousands upon thousands of people and names, most of whom we have no actual personal connection with, every time we open a news app on our phone or watch the news at night. We weren't designed for that. So it shouldn't be surprising that my generation has been termed the mental health generation, because we've been connected our whole lives, and our brains can't handle the amount of information that we're receiving. 
The thing is, even if you didn't grow up in that interconnected information age, or if you were right on the cutting edge of it, you're still receiving more than you were designed to handle. And you are in desperate need of hope. Then again, that isn't particularly unique to our generation. While the problems are a little bit different, the solution is still the same. Human beings have always been in need of hope. Even if you have a small circle and a small amount of issues that you have to handle, there's always been one truth, one certainty in life, or as a founding father put it, two certainties in life, death and taxes. And if those are the two certainties that we have to look forward to, then certainly we need some hope. And regardless of when you've lived, where you've lived, or how much power or influence you have, how little or how much information you've had to handle, death has always been a certainty. And so at least in that area, human beings have always needed hope. What's the point of this whole soliloquy? Many of us are handling more than we were designed to handle. We are in need of hope. And even if you feel like, no, I'm in a good place, I have a good equilibrium in my life, death is still a certainty. And as that approaches, as it will for each one of us, whether we expect it or not, whether we experience death in our families or whether we are lucky and experience very little before we ourselves pass away, we still need hope. It's interesting to me how many churches in our area have this line or a line very similar to this, hope for tomorrow, in their mission statements. I was talking to Noah Fricci down at City Hope Church the other day, and what's that middle word in their name, City Hope? Yeah, part of their mission statement is to give the city hope. It's right there in their name, but it's also in their mission statement. I was talking to Bryce over at FCC, another good friend of mine, and he's talking about how they don't they haven't crafted a mission statement like ours yet, and that's fine. It's just a thing that we did because it's helpful. But he said that their model, the thing that they're trying to do in their church is create disciples who make more disciples to pass on the hope that is found in the gospel. Again, it's about hope. Now, there's been a few things recently that I want to celebrate that we've done to try to spread that hope and enable others to spread that hope. Uh, Yesterday was a long day for me and Mags and Brandy. We were running around a lot, but it was a good day. We started off our day going out to West Frankfurt to a Christian service camp out there that we support. And we gathered with a bunch of other church leaders with uh, that guy in the middle there. His name's Mike, Mike Killebrews from E2 Effective Elders. We sponsored bringing him down here to present on how to minister to the next generation, how to reach and keep the next generation in our churches. Because this upcoming generation, they're even more interconnected than my generation was. And they need hope. They need hope. And so we got together with a bunch of mostly old people, and we talked about how we can connect with people that maybe we don't have a lot in common with, maybe some of us more than others, about different strategies, different things that we can do to involve young people in our churches. And I don't just mean how do we get them to sit in pews on Sunday, but how do we actually get them involved? How do we get them serving? How do we get them in through the doors in the first place? When so many of them see church as a place that is, uh, at the very least, stodgy and unnecessary, but in worst case scenario, maybe even oppressive, what do we do? And Mike has decades of experience working with youth from various generations, and he had some great insights to share with us. Now, this group is pretty small, right? And you can't quite see everyone in this picture, but there are 16 total people there. Do you guys want to guess how many churches those 16 people represented? I heard five, I heard 16, not 16. We had three there. Eight. We had 16 people representing eight different churches. Most of them small, few of them medium-sized. We had Heartland Christian Church, First Christian Church in Anna, First Christian Church Murphy, of course, us. We're pretty nice. I like this church. 16 total churches, and we'll say on average, each one of those churches has 15 youth that they interact with. What's 15 times eight? Can someone do the math for me real quick? 120, so conservatively, 120 youth that are hopefully impacted by this. Now, 15 is probably a low number, so could it be 150, 200 youth impacted by this one little thing that we did? That's awesome. And the reason why we do things like this is to teach people to spread the hope that is found in the gospel to the next generation, to those outside of our walls, or those that are in our walls but are still searching. That's why we do stuff like this. There's another thing that we did that I think spread hope uh, Chris already mentioned it. Yesterday, we gathered out here for an emergency early trunk or treat because there was a young man, about five years old, by the name of Jameer, 
And Jameer has leukemia, so unfortunately he will be missing Halloween. Now, do we bring him here to preach to him about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, in a way, but not with words, rather with our actions. You see, Jameer is a young man, and I firmly believe that the young people in our midst deserve to, I don't know, have a childhood. And much of his childhood is being robbed from him by this disease. So what are we going to do? We're going to make an extra Halloween for him. And many of you guys participated, and many people, not even members of our church, just members of our community, came out and participated as well. Uh, can we play this video? Or did it get uploaded as a picture? That's okay. It probably got uploaded as a picture. Um, but if you want to see it, grab me afterwards. We had this parking lot, and this was about halfway through, I think, when we were still having people coming in before we actually started. We had, what, two, three dozen cars out there with multiple people at each car, and everyone's high-fiving Jameer and saying hi to him and talking to him, seeing how he is, and he was stoked because he's filling up his little pumpkin full of candy and just getting to have a childhood because we have a church that decided that we want to provide healing, help, and hope for our community. Our church wants to be a church that acts, wants to be a church that does. We see a society that is in need of hope. We see children with leukemia. We see news apps full of depressing news. We see people that even if their life is going pretty well, the reality is one day they are going to die. And we know that these people need hope. And the greatest hope that the church can offer, yes, we can offer things like this trunk or treat, and yes, we can offer things like our outreach ministries, and yes, we can offer these, these little things of healing, these little acts of hope. But the greatest hope that we can offer is found in the gospel. The hope that even when we pass away, even when we die, that there is still a life beyond this. Not only a life beyond this, but a life that is better. A life without mourning, a life without crying, a life without pain, a life without disease, a life without death. And there's a little church that I want to tell you about that was found in the Roman Empire that had a close relationship with the Apostle Paul, a church in the city of Thessalonica that was really similar to our church in a lot of ways. It was a church that, even in hard times, it held on to the faith. It was a church that, while not perfect, did its best to follow the decrees of Jesus. But there's one notable difference, at least I hope it's a difference. The church in Thessalonica, while they were serving, there was one little part of the gospel they weren't sure about. They didn't know about that whole like life after death thing. And Paul takes this really seriously, and this seems super bizarre to us. If you grew up in the church, because you probably hear about life after death all the time, but we're, we're going to die, we're going to go to heaven. And you've heard my complaints about, like, yeah, well, it's not really like heaven comes here, we don't go to heaven. But, okay. but Paul takes this, this issue really seriously, because apparently somewhere along the line, when Paul was communicating the gospel to them, they missed a part of it. That even those who have passed on, even those who are asleep in death, that even those people still have hope that one day we might be re united with them. They missed that. And therefore, they were missing the hope of the gospel, the hope for tomorrow. And many of us, we've experienced loved ones, family, friends, members of our church family passing on. And the clear message that we're going to see in just a moment in the letter to Thessalonians is that we have hope to see those people again. We have hope to be united with our Savior alongside them. That we do have, even in the face of death, hope for tomorrow. So Paul writes to this church in Thessalonica. He was worried about them. He was worried that in the face of persecution they would give up. And he sent his brother Timothy to them. And Timothy returned with a report and said they are a faithful church and they're holding on. But they have some questions because somebody somewhere told them that if you die before Jesus returns, that that's the end. That there is no hope for tomorrow. And Paul responds to this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Starting in verse 13, he says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve as the rest of mankind who have no hope. So Paul paints this picture here, has this assumption behind this verse, where he says, there are these people who have no hope. There are those that they love who have passed on. They know that eventually they will die as well. Regardless of how wonderful or how horrible their life is, they know that sooner or later we're all going to be in the ground. But they have no hope, because that death is the end. So whatever you accomplish in this life, it's meaningless, as Ecclesiastes would put it. It's simply a vapor. It doesn't 
last. You can't take it with you. But beyond that, not only can you not take it with you, there's nothing, nowhere to take it to. You pass away, and that's the end. And so these people, they live their lives with no hope, living purely for today, purely for tomorrow, because whenever it ends, it ends. And many people in our community, many people in our world, they live the exact same way, firmly believing that when it ends, it ends, or hoping against hope that, well, maybe there's something out there, but I don't know what it is, and I have no assurance of it. And Paul says these people, when they grieve, when they lose a loved one, or when their own death is coming, they grieve as those who have no hope, with no assurance that there's something better to come. He says you aren't going to be like that, because you have hope. In verse 14, he says this, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so that we believe that God will bring Jesus with those who have fallen asleep in him. This is something really important here. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Both of those things are pretty important to Christians. Let me break it down really quickly for you. Christians believe and always have believed that Jesus died. Now remember, we believe that Jesus is fully man and fully God, the second person of what we call the Trinity. Okay? So you have God, right? God is this being that we worship who has always existed, who is all-powerful, who is all-knowing, who is all-loving, who is all-good. And God is consisting of three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is what we normally call them. We have a few different names that we'll call each one of them. Each one of these persons is fully God and also intimately interconnected with the other two persons. We call this the Trinity. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That second one, the Son, came to earth, lived as a human being, fully experiencing what it means to be human, but also at the same time fully experiencing what it means to be God although giving up, emptying himself, as Paul puts it, of some of the rights that goes with being God, making himself, at least temporarily, reliant upon the Father and upon the Holy Spirit. And Jesus lives among people for around about 33 years, and then he is executed, because some of the things that he taught, some of the things that he showed people about how God intended people to live wasn't uh, very popular in his day and age, just like it's not particularly popular today. And those who should have followed him, who should have worshipped him, cried out for his execution, and he was killed. But he told his followers this was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen. He had predicted it, and he said, don't worry, three days later I will rise, just as Jonah spent three days in the belly of the fish. Three days later, you want to guess what happened? He rose Again, and this is super significant because Jesus can talk about dying for the sins of the people and he can teach wonderful, amazing truths, but if it stops there, he's just a good teacher. Or he's just another Judean rebel that the Roman Empire executed before he became too much of a problem. If Jesus' life ends with crucifixion, he was nice, but he's not that important. But the early church claimed over and over again, Jesus rose again. And they had very simple logic here. You ready ready for this? Jesus died, and he came back to life. People that normally, normally, when people die, they they stay dead. Yeah? Any of you guys ever seen someone come back to life? I haven't either. Normally when people die, they stay dead. Jesus did not stay dead, which hints to us that maybe there's a little something more to him. In fact, they took it just a step further because Jesus promised that one day he would return. Jesus promised his followers and his followers repeated over and over again that when he returned, the dead in Christ would rise. So if Jesus died and he came back to life, it's proof that sort of thing can happen and when he comes back, he can resurrect us as well. There's hope. But the Thessalonians, they'd miss this. And Paul reminds them, Jesus died and he rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus all those who fall asleep in him. In other words, when Jesus returns, everyone who has passed on before you, they will come with him. According to the, words, or to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who had fallen Again, they'd been taught that if you died before Jesus returned, that was it for you. Now, if you could hold on until he got here, they thought, okay, well, Jesus will keep you alive. 
But if you die first, there's no hope for you. And that's just not the truth. The truth is, whether you are alive or whether you are dead, there is still hope because Jesus can even resurrect the dead. He continues, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. He's almost repeating himself over and over. The dead will come back. Those who are dead in Christ, those who have followed the Lord with their lives, they will be resurrected. They will be on the earth, in the new heavens and the new earth for eternity, living with us, living with God. There is still hope. And he even gives us almost a little, a little picture here. That the Lord will come from heaven. There will be a loud command, the voice of an archangel and a trumpet. Now, does that mean that we're going to hear someone yell? Just, ah! And then we'll hear a trumpet like, I don't know, what noise does a trumpet make? It's been a while since I've been in band. Sorry, guys. Uh Does that mean that we're going to hear those noises and be like, it's time? Maybe. Are these symbols of something else? Maybe. But the important part is the Lord himself will come. He will return, and the dead in Christ will rise. Even death cannot extinguish our hope. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. And this image, I know it's super bizarre. We're going to like float up. Has anyone ever seen like Left Behind stuff? Like read a Left Behind book? Seen like a Left Behind movie or something? They're like super popular in like the 80s. And it's like, you're like, you know, like an angel singing, and then like everyone's clothes fall off for whatever reason, and then they like float into the sky. It's super bizarre. That's not what he's saying here. This idea of being caught up together or being brought out together, it's an image of a very normal occurrence in the Roman Empire. Not up the up in the clouds part. That has to do with ancient cosmology and God lives up here and we live down here. But the idea of being caught up or called out or brought out together, that verb can be translated a couple different ways. Uh, it's an image of what we call Roman triumph. A Roman triumph is when a king or a general goes out to battle, they win the battle, and they send a messenger back and says, hey, I won the battle, get a party ready. And as they're coming back into the city, the delegates from the city would go out and meet the general outside the walls and start the celebration, and they'd party all the way through the city. That's the image that we're getting here. That Jesus, when he comes back from heaven, that we will go and meet him, and we're going to bring that party back into the city. There's still hope, even in the face of death. Jesus is going to come back, not just with a trumpet and not just with the sound of an angel. And he's not just going to come back in punishment and judgment, but he's going to come back with a party. And he's going to bring the dead in Christ back to life. And we are going to celebrate and we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, what does he say? Encourage one another with these words. But here's a really, really, really simple take home for you. Are you ready? Encourage one another with these words. I don't even have to write a little pithy statement for this. Paul did it for me. You want a like good summary? What, what should Christians talk about? Talk about this. If you're trying to tell someone, hey, you know, I, I love my church and I love Jesus and I would love for you to just join us. Just give us a chance. What should you say to them? Maybe these words are a good place to start. You open up your news app and you see thing after thing about Russia and about China and about OPEC and about all these other foreign nations who are doing things that are affecting our life here. And you're like, man, this is really depressing and I feel like I have no power over this situation because you don't. We don't have any power over those situations. And you're thinking, well, what do I do with this? Encourage one another with these words. Because come war or famine or disease or COVID lockdowns, come anything in this life, we still have hope. Because one day, Jesus is returning. He's bringing a party with him, and even death cannot stop him. The Thessalonians missed that, at least for a little bit, and luckily Paul got to them eventually and reminded them, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another that nothing can stand in the way of Jesus, that no matter what happens, we still have hope for tomorrow. And we need to share that hope with this community. This week, I want you to do one thing for me, okay? Or if you don't like me, do one thing for Jesus, okay? If you're not sure about Jesus, do one thing for Paul. I don't, like, just pick, okay? One thing. I want you to pick one person. Inside the church or outside of the church. Maybe it's someone that you've been thinking for a while, man, I just, I really should, I should invite them, I I, I should reach out to them, and maybe there's that that one person outside these walls, you're just like, man, I've I've been putting this off 
And maybe this is your, your call. Maybe this is your time. You need to go to that person and offer them this kind of hope and say, hey, just give us a chance. Give Jesus a chance. Or maybe there's someone inside the church that you're just like, man, that person, for whatever reason, I feel like I just need to encourage them. And maybe you need to find a way to reach out and encourage them with these words and remind them, hey, your place in this body is important. And it is for each and every one of you. You have an important place in the body of Christ. And there is this hope waiting for you that one day when Jesus returns, no matter how hard things are now, they're going to be amazing then. Maybe you just need to remind someone in our church family of that, or maybe there's a friend that you have that's in another congregation in this town or outside of the state or a member of your biological family that you need to reach out to and you need to remind and you need to encourage. So pick one person in our church family, in your family, at work, outside in the town. Just pick one person and encourage them with these words. Will you guys do that for me? Okay, let's pray. Lord, Thank you so much for being a God who gives hope. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to give hope to others. God, thank you for yesterday, for being able to gather with other people who care about the next generation, who want to serve them. Thank you for our volunteers and our staff members and our elders and everyone here who cares about the next generation, who cares about reaching them with the word of the gospel. Thank you for those outside of our church and those in our church that have a passion for those outside of our walls, that we would be able to bring them hope, that we would be able to improve the reputation, not just of our church, but of your kingdom, God, that we would be able to show them that your kingdom is a wonderful place that they were designed to be a part of. And God, we ask this week that you would give us opportunities to encourage other believers and to bring those who do not yet know you close. I ask that for every member of this congregation and everyone joining us online, that you would give them, right now, in their mind, you'd give them one person they need to reach out to, one person that they need to encourage, one person they need to invite, that one person, and that you would give them the courage to do so, God. Thank you for being the Lord of hope, and the Prince of Peace, our wonderful Counselor and Savior. And God, thank you for putting up with us. We love you, Jesus. And in your name we pray, for your kingdom we pray, amen.